Take your Bibles this morning and open up to the book of John, chapter 16. John, chapter 16, we're going to read verses 7 and 8 here this morning. Jesus speaking in this passage of Scripture, and there's, there's several things. that he's, it's, uh, John, chapter 16, is kind of in the middle of a larger message that Jesus is preaching. And so I, I encourage you to go back and read, but in this passage of Scripture, in verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. One of the things he's told the apostles is that his death is, is coming. You know, there's this, there's this end for him, that he's going to be leaving them. And, and if you remember, you know, Peter, when he first heard that, he's grieved in his heart, and he rebukes Jesus, and, and Jesus turns around and calls, says, you know, get thee behind me, Satan. It's a, it's a heavy thing to think about Jesus going away. But here in this passage of Scripture, he's saying to those apostles, it's expedient, it's needful, it's important to you that I do go away. Because of what comes after Christ goes away in this passage of Scripture. So back in verse 7, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And so as Jesus went, as he left, he rose back into heaven at the, um, the days of Pentecost. The Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to us, the Comforter, both of those apostles, and then given to you and I to even still to this day. And so that Comforter is here for us. And then in verse 8 it says, And when He has come, that is the Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. That's the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit there. Some of the works, and we're going to examine some of those works of the Holy Spirit, but He shall reprove the world of sin. I think one of the first scenes we see when the Holy Spirit comes, aside from the apostles receiving that Holy Spirit and the gifts and abilities they were given to speak in, in, a, in clarity in all the nations and the languages, the different languages that were represented there, they heard the apostles clearly. But as, as the Holy Spirit was given and, and Peter standing before the crowd and preaching Christ and Christ crucified, preaching it plainly to those people who didn't understand Christ, to the Jews that were there, some of those very Jews, I believe, that was a part of, of His crucifixion, the Holy Spirit delivered a clear message, the gospel message to those people, and they heard that message. The Spirit reproved them of sin, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter gave further instruction through the Holy Spirit there, Repent, every one of you, be baptized in the name of the... Uh, of the Son, Jesus Christ. And so the people began to respond. That's the work of the Spirit in the hearts of those people, in Peter, in declaring the clarity of that message, but also the work of the Spirit in working in the hearts, reproving the sin that was there, bringing about repentance. It's the goodness of God that led those men to that place of repentance. And so I want to take just a few moments to just examine the Holy Spirit this morning. And so... We're here in John, so let's just, let's just back up to John chapter 15 and verse 26. The end of verse, chapter 15 there. Look at verse 26 with me. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. There are several things that said in that little verse that we just read there, but the thing that I'm after in that particular verse is the work of the Spirit is that He, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, will testify of Jesus Christ. How is it that you and I, we've, we've come together today for the purpose of worshiping Jesus, of hearing something out of His Word. You wouldn't come here if I was going to read to you and study something out of some other um, book. You come because the Word is what you desire because it reveals to us Jesus Christ. How is it that we can hear and believe and understand and know and see Jesus Christ the way that we're able to see Him today? Because there's times where, well, the Word of God says the world might read these very words and they count it nothing but foolishness. But the people who love God, they read the words of God. I, I think of that song, the, the, uh, it's the saints of God who have heard that song many times that whenever they hear that song again, it just every time it's sweeter and sweeter to them. The story of Jesus Christ just grows sweeter and sweeter because the more that we hear and that we see and understand out of God's Word of who Jesus Christ is, the greater and the bigger our Lord is over us and the more wonderful He is. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit that works in our hearts and our minds, and, and as we read, that gives revelation, and then as we go about life, He gives testimony. He testifies that 
Christ is active and in a work. We can take some of the examples as given Brother Billy alone or, or um, Brother Jones or Sister Michelle sitting with us this morning who's been sick for quite a while. God answering prayers, just the spirit that says, no, that's not medical science that made them whole. It's not the doctor that was just this wonderful professional doctor who had all the perfect stuff. No, the Spirit declares to us, Jesus Christ is the great physician. The doctors can do only all that they can do. And if you think about it, all the doctors can do is make it a little bit worse. They cut open the sores and the wounds and they cut out some of the parts that they... Th it's, it's the Lord who gives the actual healing every single time. The doctors never have the ability to heal. And if, and if we only looked at those kind of things, we would think, man, that doctor or those physicians or that medication, and we would exalt those kind of things. But the Holy Spirit in our life testifies of Jesus Christ. That we got from A to B with protection because the Lord was with us. That we have this understanding because the Lord has given us that understanding. That, we, that the Father loves us. See, it doesn't make sense in human flesh for us to think about love coming through death. It takes the Holy Spirit revealing and testifying Jesus Christ came into this world and lived a perfect life and died a perfect death for the complete expression of the love of the Father toward us. And it requires the Spirit of God to make that plain to us. I won't declare to you in the flesh as a, as a human that I love you by sacrificing my children. That's not going to happen for me. But that's how the Father shows love one of the ways that the Father shows love. And it takes the Spirit of God to reveal and testify Jesus Christ to us. And so I'm thankful as we think about that for just a moment of the work of the Holy Spirit because without the Holy Spirit today, we would be walking in foolishness. We would think that we had an understanding of Christ. I've tried in, in passages of Scriptures to make sense of one thing or the other and I read one passage and then I go to someplace else and I'm like, well, that contradicts the other passage of Scripture. And, and there's been times where I felt like I'm just all confused. God's Word says, if you continue in my truth, if you continue in my Word, then shall you know the truth. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals that truth. Amen. He testifies of Jesus Christ. It's expedient. It's important. It's needful for you and I that Jesus went away and Him to send the Comforter to us. Go with me over to the book of Romans, chapter 8 of the book of Romans. I think chapter 8 is probably my favorite chapter in all, all of that particular book of the Bible. Chapters 4, 5, 6, 7 is leading up to, uh, or it's, 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 it's a heavier part of reading of God's Word and it takes the Spirit of God to help us to understand that, but it goes from saying you're a sinner and you're not a sinner. You've got this struggle, but you don't have this struggle anymore. You know, it's back and forth with what, what, who we are but the, the change is because of Christ. The change is because of what God has done for us through Christ. And as it's looking at these things in, in a, those first few those chapters there in the book of Romans, it culminates in this, beginning in chapter 8, verse 1. It culminates in, in this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now jump down with me to verses 14, 15, and 16. It says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That's really the verse that I'm after. But go on with me, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are... Now listen to this word. Just declaring... This passage of Scripture is declaring very clearly and very plainly who you are. Verse 16, the Spirit itself, the Holy Spirit that God and the Father sent to us declares or bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You think about that for a moment. We back up and try to read through Romans 4, 5, 6. We're reminded of how, how much of a sinner we are. We're reminded of how difficult life is and how often I'm lifted up in, in pride and how much I struggle and how often my own thoughts, not the Word of God, my own thoughts contradict themselves and betray what I really want and those kind of things. See, Satan is very good with speaking lies into our minds and telling us things about ourselves to try to give us a sense of identity that's different than what God says about us. 
And so he says, oh, if that's who you are, you might as well go ahead and just live that out. You'll never be anything better than that. The world also does a fantastic and phenomenal job, without Satan's help, of declaring identity in the life of people. We, we give labels and we, we look for um, per other people's opinion and we look for certain styles or certain um, ways of... All of those things that the world offers declares for you this is who you are. It's your identity. We ask most time men when we first meet someone, how you doing, where you're from, and what you do. You know, we're looking for identity kind of statements from each other. Because that's how we're created. We're created to find belonging and identity. <coughs> and according to this passage of Scripture, we won't find it in the world. Because the world declares us identities that will always fall short. We will not find it in, the, in Satan and the devil because his identities that he offers to us are always lies. It is never who you truly are. And if you're thinking in your mind ever, well, this is just who I am. And that idea of who you are contradicts something in God's word. It's a lie from the devil. It is not who you are. It is time for you to begin to listen to the Spirit of God because it's the Spirit of God that's working in us that the Father and the Son sent to us that declares for us you are a child of God. And as a child of God, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. As a child of God, we have access to us the whole counsel of God's Word and with the Spirit an understanding of His Word and with the understanding with the Spirit a walk of obedience to His Word and with that walk of obedience fellowship with Jesus Christ all empowered to us by the gift of the Spirit of God in our life. Isn't that beautiful? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh we have to be careful there. But after the Spirit, the Spirit goes before us and it guides and directs us. I haven't taken time and don't have scriptures I'm going to turn to, but, but just in case there's confusion, the Holy Spirit is God. It's not some separate entity. The Holy Spirit is God. And so God knows all things perfectly. He can speak and He can understand what you're going through in this very moment, or in your darkest of moments, or in your secret sin, or in your mountaintop experiences, and speak perfectly, and guide you perfectly, and give you the kind of comfort that you need perfectly. I'm thankful that God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ sent to us the Spirit, when we begin to look at what all the Spirit does. <clears throat> Go with me. Let's back up to Isaiah chapter 61 for a second. Isaiah chapter 61, I'm going to... I think I'm going to use myself as an example here for just a second, but let's look first at verse 1 together. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I just, that's all I'm after in that passage of Scripture is just that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him for this particular work. When God calls us, first of all, when God calls us to work, and, and there's a work that God's established for every one of us to do, whether it's to, it's to minister in gentleness toward the older ladies, toward a younger sister in Christ, or you older men toward a younger brother in Christ, whether it's to help a mother with her kids, or whether it's you know, whatever, there's a ministry for every one of us to care for those that are elderly and sick. And the Spirit of God will be upon you, equipping you to do every ounce of the work that he has called and equipped and given direction for you to do. We often think in our mind, I, I, I don't know that I can do that. You know, I'm, I'm not smart enough. or I'm not, It's not really my... If the Spirit of God has given you direction, the Spirit of God will also give you, equip you with the strength and the power and the understanding and the ability to do what God has prompted you to do. Since I, I haven't been with Love's Chapel, um, I've preached a couple of times, a couple of times here in a couple of different churches. And, and with me filling in for Brother Billy the past couple of days, one of the things that I miss, that I recognize how lazy I've become just in the few short months that I've not been preaching weekly, is whenever you approach God's Word, my prayer is always this, when I begin to pray um, in preparing for a message, Father, what would you have me to speak before your people at Waycross Church? 
And then all through the week as I'm praying and thinking about those things, I have ideas and I'm studying myself and I have passages of scriptures that I, I enjoy. I'm like, man, that's really good. And I want to, and then, and then when it comes down to time to where uh, I'm going to put some words to paper, I'm going to be into order the scriptures and I'm going to look at what God would really have. There's a wrestling. There's a, there's a battle that takes place. And the battle is between me and my flesh and what I want to say and surrendering that and giving that up that I might be able to be obedient to what God has to say. Because God has a message for every one of us every time we gather together as a people and we hear the preaching of His Word. We can go back to Romans and we can see that plainly. The hearing and the believing and the understanding comes to the preaching of His Word. And it's the Spirit of God that equips and gives direction. I would imagine, I've not asked Brother Billy this question, but, but some of you who are... Um, Brother Billy's asked to come and stand before the church and to teach. Well, willing, Brother Josh is going to be teaching tonight. And as they come and they, they look at scriptures, there's always a wrestle with what, would, what do I really need to say. And I'm not looking at me in those kind of passages. I'm looking back at this. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon you and I as the servants of God when we begin to do and walk in obedience to what God has called us to do to fulfill that work. That is the work of the Spirit in our life. Isaiah 61 there, I'm going to read it again to you in verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. And it goes on from there. And, and I would hasten to say this real quick like, we gather together in fellowship as a body of believers here at Waycross or in time of worship here or in time of prayer or whenever there's a need to go and serve in the community and sing at someone's house or, or build a ramp or whatever kind of things because God's blessed the servant who's been here. We're not, not to elevate the servant. God's blessed the people who are here not to elevate any one particular person through His Spirit that you and I have tasted and we've experienced the working of the Spirit. And it's that spirit that draws us back every time. It's that spirit that keeps us in comfort. It's that spirit that confirms in us that's truth that we just heard. It's that spirit that confirms in us and works in us. There's a work to be done. Let us go and arise and build and do that good work. He always equips us. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 16. In this passage of Scripture, Paul and, and different men of God have been going around preaching and sharing the gospel message everywhere that they go. And they're, they're seeing the fruit of their labors. They're seeing the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit that's at work everywhere they go. And there, there are people who are converted and they, they um, begin to walk with the, the Lord and they begin to rejoice in who Christ is and what He's done for them. And they understand truth. And then, and then out of that, there's people who are beginning to be called by God to begin to teach and further the gospel message. I'm thankful that there's all kinds of opportunities in front of us today to, to, to minister and to do and to say what God's Word says. We're without opportunity to have a work in front of us. If you don't see a work in front of you, open your eyes. But there's a good work of the Holy Spirit here when we look at all of these things that could and need to be done. Go with me to verse, let's just read verse 6 for the sake of time here. Now when they had gone, this is 16 verse 6, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mount... I'm going to pause there because that's what I'm after. Just in verse 6, you hear what, he, what it just said there? So there was a mind of those who were ministering, Paul and the others that were with him. You know, look at what God's word... Look at what's happening here. Well, let's go on into Asia. That may have been their thought. It doesn't record the thought quite like that in Scripture, but that may have been their thought. There was opportunity indeed in Asia. There's people in Asia who have not heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's go on into Asia. But the work of the Holy Spirit in this passage of Scripture is to close a door. It's to say, no, that's not the direction for you to go. He forbade them to go. And I'm thankful to see that work of the Spirit of God as well. There are many times in my life where I think, man, this is what I'm about to do. This is a good direction to go. I'm, I'm excited about it and I'm pumped up about it and I'm, I'm ready to hit the ground running. And the Holy Spirit closes that door for me. And I get upset about the closing of the door. Well, God, I, I wanted to do that. 
And it, it takes quite a while sometimes to see the blessing of why God closed, why the Spirit of God said, you may not go in that direction. Don't go into Asia, he told the, um, Paul and those disciples that was there preaching the message of God. And he does the same thing for you and I. I'm so thankful that we have a God who watches and sees and goes before us. And when we begin to head out in a direction with good intents, I'm not talking about ill intents, with good intentions, that even in those kind of moments, the Spirit of God will work in our life to restrain us from going in a direction or from doing some things that's contrary to His will. There's comfort. That's why, one of the reasons why the, the, and John calls it in the book of John, the comforter. He does comfort us, but there's comfort in knowing that the Holy Spirit is doing all of these works. Our ears need to be turned to Him and listening to Him. There's comfort in that. Go back to John chapter 14. Two more verses for us to look at. Let's begin in verse 15. Verse 15 says, Jesus speaking here, If you love me, keep my commandments. And that's an important commandment that Christ has given to every one of us. If we, want to, if, if we love Jesus Christ, there is a work for us to do. It's to keep His commandments. I mean, that's, that's a, a simple instruction. Why then is it so hard for us to do that? I get up Monday morning and I hit the ground running and I'm doing all these works. And, and you know, I hit noon, lunchtime, we pause. At quarter three, we have a Bible study at noon. And I'm, sometimes that's the first time I've thought of God that day. It shouldn't be that way. If you love me, Christ says, keep my commandments. Look at 15, 16 now. Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Now listen to this right here. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now we know that, you know, we, we understand the concept of that, but I want you to think about that. So Doris started teaching this year, and I'm used for, for 20 something years, Doris has been at home. I could pick up the phone and I call her, I need this or I want this. And that. She's in a classroom, I can't pick up the phone and call her. I do not like it. Um, there will be a retirement date soon for Doris with that school. <laughs> She's not accessible to me. But the Holy Spirit is always. There's never a time where He's not accessible to us. He shall dwell and be amongst us. He shall be, and He is, in us. We're without excuse, brethren. We're without excuse to, to go about the course of our day and to not call upon God and to walk in obedience to His commandments whenever the Holy Spirit is within us as the people of God, as the born-again children of God, not, do, not, not trying to give an excuse to God like the world does. Well, I just didn't hear. I didn't know. We can't use that excuse. The world cannot receive Him, but the child of God sees and the Spirit of God dwells within so that at any point in time, we can pause and we can ask. And the Spirit that dwells in us will guide us into truth, will comfort us, will restrain us, will stir in our hearts and our minds to a good work, will empower us to fulfill that work, will do everything necessary if we would pause and begin to consider. Go down to verse 26 in that same chapter. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You see why we're without excuse? That's the work, one of the works of the Holy Spirit in you and our our minds and our life on a daily basis. He will comfort, He will teach, and He will help you to remember everything that the Lord has said. So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And He knows how simple-minded and how ignorant or how rebellious and stiff-necked we are. And so in His plan, He sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, to be that comforter for us, that we might be able to do that very thing, to keep His commandments, to help us to remember what those commandments are and what God has taught us, what the Lord has taught us to do and to walk in. There are other works we could turn to, but let's go to Luke. Luke chapter 11. In closing, let's go to this verse. 
If anything, this verse right here is the instruction for you and I as the people of God then. It's the application to this particular um, string of, of verses we've looked at about the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 11, in this passage of Scripture, let's, let's back up to verse 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, and then we have the example prayer that we pray at the beginning of every service. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, let me three, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in, in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. So he's using the example of that prayer here. He's saying, this is how you pray. And now let me give you an example. How many of you, if a friend comes and you need some, some, something to use to cook, and you go over to your neighbor's house and you want to borrow, and he's like, well, I'm in bed. Okay, go back with an empty hand, I can't do anything about it. That's not what this parable is about, this passage is about. It goes on and it says in verse 8, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, the, per, the, per, the persistent and the earnestness of seeking after that friend and saying, but I have need. I have need. I've got a work that the Lord has put before me to do. And, and I, I need... And so that importunity and that fervency and persistency in pursuing the work that's in front of them. But for his importunity, he says there, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, in verse 9, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. There's, there's instruction. It's not just in the words that we say, as he gives that, that example prayer. It's in the earnestness and the fervency and the persistency of that prayer. Ask, seek, knock, it'll be opened. Verse 10, for everyone that asks receive, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask him a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? You know, it's the love of the father he's pointing to here, but no, if my son called and needed food, I'm not going to Give him a stone to eat. That doesn't make sense. Go make some stone soups. And there's a children's story about that. That's foolishness. No, because I love my son, I'll find something for him to eat. Because we love one another, we'll begin to try to see what we can do to minister. Go down to verse 13. That's what I'm after. If ye then, being evil... Now, the Scripture, Jesus is calling us in the flesh evil there. He's declaring something about us. But it says this. This is the, the, the goodness of this scripture. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give what? Holy the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him. How much more? If you being evil know how to give that bread to the son who's hungry or that, that care to the friend who's struggling, how much more is what the scripture, what Jesus Himself declares Lord, teach us to pray. Okay, here's, some example, here's an example prayer. And pray with fervency and importunity. And connected to all of that truth, he says, now ask for the Holy Spirit. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And so the challenge to us as we examine the work of the Holy Spirit, and I've only scratched the surface with looking at the Holy Spirit, but as we, the challenge for us as we examine the, the work of the Holy Spirit in comforting and guiding and restraining and equipping and all the things that the Holy Spirit does is don't go through a day without asking for the, the Father to give you the measure of the Holy Spirit that's necessary that you not, may not only be equipped to do the basic duties of that day, but that you're equipped to do all that you do to the glory of Jesus Christ in that day. Let us ask. Ask, seek, knock. It'll be given and opened. And the specific thing that'll be given and opened in this, in, in this passage is the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace of our Lord and our Savior 
remind us through the Spirit every day to stop and to ask, to seek the Holy Spirit out, to know that in the Holy Spirit we can do what God has equipped us and called us to do, that God has given us. It was expedient for the Lord to leave that while we live today, it was needful for us to have the Spirit of God directing us. How often do we not ask? And how often does it go awry in our life because we thought that we knew something, yet we weren't operating in the wisdom that the Spirit gave? It's my prayer that we would all ask for the Spirit of God on a daily basis. Amen. My prayer for Christ's sake. Brother David, what number do you have for us? Number 207. When we walk with